There are so many questions when it comes to the next game, and one of the major questions is what timeline are we going to be in? The Milky Way Galaxy's story and Andromeda's story are separated by more than 600 years and feel completely disconnected. So how can these two timelines even come together? It's possible, but it's definitely complicated, so let's break it down. I've made a visual of the entire timeline, including the major events from both the original trilogy and Andromeda. The original trilogy's main events are in orange, and the Andromeda events are in teal. And there's a major gap of time in between these two timelines, and very little overlap at all. Any real overlap comes from five major plot points. Gian Garson's death and the identity of the Benefactor, the Corian Ark, the Scourge, the discovery of the Geth Telescope, and AI research, which I'll explain more later, and then another possibility that we don't have a direct connection to in both galaxies, but could be made into one, is the identity of the Jardan and whatever race they were at war with. So first off, we have the mystery of Gian Garson's death and the identity of the Benefactor, which are tied together. Garson founded the Andromeda Initiative in 2176. When she began the project, it was intended as a way to expand exploration, discovery, and research. Shortly after beginning the initiative, she ran out of money, and the Benefactor stepped forward to anonymously fund the project, with two major stipulations. One, that the project would change to have 100,000 colonists on five arcs that comprised all of the races of the Milky Way galaxy, and the second stipulation is that Alec Ryder would be made the human pathfinder and would continue his work on Sam in Andromeda. The benefactor had already contacted Alec Ryder about this, even before contacting Garson. It's important to note that the benefactor volunteered to do this, so we have to think they have some good motivations, especially if they knew about the Reaper threat. And we know that the benefactor knew something was coming. Garson tells us that something big spooked the benefactor in the Milky Way galaxy and that Shepard made it real. So the benefactor has to have some access to some pretty deep information to have known something like this, on top of having an endless supply of money. We also know that Garson never met the benefactor and that the benefactor went to great lengths to keep their identity hidden. So this person is from the Milky Way galaxy's timeline has access to unlimited funds and intelligence, and is hiding their identity. Garson hid secret encrypted messages about the benefactor, fearing for her life. And in her last audio log, it sounds like whoever was attempting to kill her was outside her room. We don't even know if this was the benefactor though. Maybe they hired someone to kill her and remained in the Milky Way galaxy. There's also a popular theory that Liara is the benefactor. But the timeline makes this impossible. Liara cannot be the benefactor. The initiative was founded in 2176, and it was shortly after that Gian Garson ran out of funds, which prompted the benefactor to come forward. Liara couldn't be the benefactor because of this timeline specifically, as she does not become the shadow broker until August of 2185, several years into the initiative's construction and development and only four short months before the initiative departs the Milky Way galaxy. So while Liara is connected to both galaxies and timelines with her conversation with Alec Ryder, she is not the benefactor. So their identity is still unknown. So essentially one major plot thread that the next game could explore is who the benefactor is. We could learn in a prequel setting, considering this person or identity is from the Milky Way galaxy. They had access to knowledge even the council refused to accept, and they had access to an endless supply of money. And they are not Cerberus. Mac Walters clarified that Cerberus would probably be really busy during this time with their own business. So this rules out Cerberus and the elusive man, who spent majority of his money on Project Lazarus anyways. So much so that Miranda even comments on it that there is no money left. And because why would the elusive man, an anti-alien, indoctrinated human, fund a project that was to protect all of the races of the Milky Way galaxy? It doesn't make sense anyways. Either way, there's a major reveal that will never be explored in a sequel. The least they could do is reveal who the benefactor is. 
Maybe they stayed behind in the Milky Way galaxy to see how things ended up. Maybe they're someone we knew. Their interest in Sam is also very suspicious. And it isn't actually the first time we're seeing AI interest in the Milky Way galaxy. And this leads me to my next plot thread that could connect the two timelines. Illegal AI research, the Systems Alliance, and the Council. I've put Alec Ryder related events in green. You can see all of the AI related incidents happened before the original trilogy. Alec became involved with the initiative because after becoming interested in AI advancement to help his wife, to the point where he even pitched his AI research to Anita Goyle, the human ambassador at the time, he was dishonorably discharged by the Systems Alliance. He then ran out of money funding the development of SAM. When this happened, the Yogg shadow broker contacted Alec, telling him to pay double for the AI he was needing to finish SAM. He was then contacted by the benefactor, who told him his research would be able to continue if he joined the initiative. I don't know the exact details of when these events happen, but after joining the initiative, the SAM kernel was stolen by none other than Anita Goyle, who turned down Alec's AI proposal several years earlier and also was involved in getting him discharged because of his AI research. She stole his SAM kernel. This is speculation on Alec's part, but the evidence does strongly point to Goyle and during his memory of their meeting, her and her assistant do seem to be oddly suspicious. At this time, the Systems Alliance was already involved in illegal AI research, both on Sidon in 2163 and later on on Quiet Eddy in 2184. This means that the Systems Alliance and former human ambassador have both been illegally involved in AI research more than once, which we know the council is strictly against. And I think this is an important bit of information considering how much the game's narrative revolves around AI and how both games focus on the advancements of AI and their level of sentience. This could be important later if the Geth truly do return. I'd also like to point out the Citadel poster that was released last year. It seems to be an in-game asset, some kind of propaganda piece for the Citadel. At the bottom it reads, Distributed by order of the Subcommittee on External Relation in Friendship Toward All, slash Peace Eternal, slash and the Brotherhood of All Sentient Life. Now this could be a fun poster that means nothing, but with the way it's presented and using the Council's logo, it looks more like something representing an in-game perspective. This tagline cannot be found anywhere else in-game. The focus here on sentient life is just interesting considering the game's major themes. So who knows, maybe we'll get more AI exploration, and there's a good foundation for it already. The next major connecting plot point is the Lost Quarian Arc, which I've marked in purple. If you've played Andromeda, you know the Quarian Arc ends on a major cliffhanger with a transmission from the Kelasia with a warning saying that their situation is not under control. The situation is referring to the outbreak across their ship. The book Annihilation goes more into this, but essentially the captain of the Kelasia revives herself in 2603 and spreads Fortinbras, which is the plague. She spreads it 150 years before the actual outbreak happens. The virus was originally intended to be a carrier virus through the Drell that was supposed to spread to the Nexus and kill the Asari, Turians, humans, and Salarians. The captain was tired of Corians being looked down on and expected Andromeda to be the exact same situation as the Milky Way when it came to the treatment of the Corians. But the virus mutated during those 150 years and spread through the Kelasia, killing many of the various races on board. They're able to create a retrovirus and then go back into cryostasis after dealing with the dead bodies. But an incoming message is received, but the cryostasis has already begun and no one is around to receive the message. So essentially this leaves on another cliffhanger. We don't know what the message was or who it was from. I suspect it could be the Nexus, but we don't know. The events of Annihilation take place in 2753, which is several years before the Nexus received the message from the Kelasia in 2819. The Corian Ark is still out there. They made a retrovirus to stop the spread of the Fortinbras plague, 
but no one knows the outcome of the remaining survivors. But this leaves a major cliffhanger in a way that cannot be explored in a prequel, like the benefactor's identity can be. All of this happened far into the future, strictly in the Andromeda timeline. The only way to find out what happens to the Quarian arc is to explore the Andromeda timeline. And we know from a comment all the way back in 2017 that Casey Hudson, who was still at Bioware at the time, knew that the Quarian arc had to be resolved in future installments. But a lot has changed since then. But one thing that hasn't changed is that Mike Gamble, who was a producer on Andromeda, is leading the next game. He's posted several tweets about Andromeda since 2018 and hasn't been subtle about the game including Andromeda in some way. But realistically, I just don't see this specific plot thread being resolved in anything other than a game taking place into the future after 2819. But I do also think this is the most popular question people want answered from Andromeda. So anything is possible. The next plot thread that could easily connect the two games and is probably the most obvious choice is the Scourge. We know that the Scourge contains element zero and is suspected to be dark energy. And we've already seen what looks like element zero in this poster. I've already done a detailed breakdown of this theory, but essentially the trailer shows what looks like a dying star. And we have also seen concept art from the teaser trailer of dying stars. There's five pieces here, but this one is titled Glowing Star Explosion. I actually tweeted about this and Mike Gamble even liked the tweet, where I specifically say, is this a dying star? So like the title of the concept art, it probably is a dying star we're seeing in the trailer. And for Mass Effect 2, we already know of a dying star, Haystrom's son, Dolan. And Haystrom actually was home to thousands of Geth units, further connecting the Geth like we've seen in the teasers. We also know that Dolan was dying because of dark energy destabilizing the star and causing it to mature too quickly by reducing the mass of its interior. So the trailer is possibly showing dying stars. And we already have a popular established plot thread from the original trilogy that connects to this. It's the perfect way to connect the game. The Scourge could easily be explored in a prequel setting where we're seeing further destabilization possibly from the mass relay explosions or something related to the endings of Mass Effect 3, or even if there is a canon ending like Synthesis. Any one of these could easily have an effect on dark energy. We also know from an interview with Mac Walters that the Scourge is not related to the Reapers, so it's the perfect way to introduce a new story. There is one caveat to this though. The Scourge is thought to have been released from the detonation on Key to Sira in 2450, this is obviously hundreds of years after the events of the original trilogy and hundreds of years before the events of Andromeda. There is still so much that is unknown about the Scourge, but I do think they could easily write in a connection between the dark energy and the Scourge between the two timelines. Like I said, maybe an event from the original trilogy destabilizes it even more. Maybe we find pockets of the Scourge in the Milky Way long before we find them in Andromeda. There's plenty of ways to connect these with good writing. And this brings me to the next possible connection, the Jardan. When the Andromeda Initiative was planning their trip to Andromeda, the remnant structures and the Scourge were not there. Clearly something happened in the Helios Cluster shortly after they left the Milky Way galaxy. The remnants were built between 2400 and 2500, with the Scourge detonating sometime around 2450. And this is suspected to be because of the Jardan warring with an unknown race. Not only were they warring with an unknown race, but they fled after everything that they had established in the Helios Cluster. After creating the Angara and Remnants and even Meridian, they were scared enough to abandon it all. And they did. When we get to Andromeda, they're completely gone and there's no known information about who they were warring with. This is another major cliffhanger of Andromeda and one that could be told in a prequel setting. We don't know what the Jardan or the race that they warred with was doing before they started building the remnants and vaults. They could easily be from another galaxy. They could have been aware of the Reapers. There's a ton of possibilities here. And I've seen a lot of theories that they are Protheans or a type of Prothean, different from Javik, and yeah, maybe. But I also think there's plenty of room to introduce new aliens. I will say though that the way the Jardan created other races does kind of remind me of the Prothean Empire. 
So maybe instead of conquering other races, they chose to create them. Maybe they really are a Prothean, or maybe they're a different race that escaped the Reapers if they're from the Milky Way galaxy. This Mass Effect 5 concept art also very much reminds me of both the Remnant and Vault aesthetics, while also looking like the aesthetics from the Prothean Empire, especially Javik's memory shard. So maybe they are a Prothean, or maybe there's a connection there. Like I said, those years before they began building to protect their technology is unknown. Anything could be written there. The next game will no doubt introduce new aliens and the Jardin or whoever they warred with could be an interesting race to introduce, especially before everything happens in Andromeda. Maybe they could be a new antagonist considering they seem pretty dangerous, enough so to cause the Angara to flee. I'm sure there's plenty of possibilities here. And finally, the last major connection between the two games, and this isn't necessarily a plot thread, but is an actual potential form of travel, the Geth Telescope. The Geth Telescope, also called the Kalos Array, is made up of three inactive primary mass relays, joined together by strange technology. It uses sensors in the combined relay corridor as a faster than light telescope. The telescope can observe intergalactic distance in almost real time. And we don't actually know a lot about it, but it is how the Andromeda Initiative and Gian Garson chose the Helios Cluster. What's interesting about this is that the Geth created this, and while it was used to look at Andromeda, the Geth actually weren't interested in Andromeda themselves. The Geth used this telescope to get star charts, equations, and images of deep space, and were searching beyond the Milky Way galaxy. But for what, we don't know. We also know that the Geth were on Haystrom researching dark energy, and we're looking into Haystrom's dying star, Dolan. So not only does this show us that the Geth were up to something that we don't know about, but if this telescope could get images from Andromeda in essentially real time, then could it be used as an actual form of travel? Or at least could this Geth and strange technology open up forms of travel or wormholes or even time travel? Maybe this strange technology isn't Reaper tech and is another alien race's technology that we haven't met yet. Maybe the Geth discover dark energy or the Scourge looking through their telescope. Who knows what they were able to see? So these are the major plot threads that can connect the two timelines and games. All except the Corian arc can be explored in a prequel setting, and the Corian arc is one story thread we'd have to explore in an actual Andromeda sequel, timeline-wise. So it'll be interesting to see what Bioware does and how they actually connect these games, since some of it seems pretty complicated. And this doesn't even go into crazy time travel, wormholes, or multiverse type of theory, which I know are pretty popular as well. Personally, I don't think Bioware will go in this direction because I think there's plenty of options for them to not have to go in this direction, but anything is possible right now. So let's explore them anyways. An important thing to remember when talking about any of those theories is that the future of the timeline is already established and cannot be changed. This means that any time travel theories where Ryder would travel back in time to join the original trilogy timeline would mean that there would be two Riders active in that timeline. And sure, I guess you could say they'd never meet since one Rider would be in cryo. There wouldn't be any issues. And I guess you could have Ryder leave the Andromeda galaxy after we finish the events of the game. So we would never actually meet the future version of Ryder who had already traveled to the past. So yeah, I guess if Bioware is that desperate to merge these two timelines, that could be a way to do it. But honestly, I'd argue time travel opens up a ton of issues with the timeline. And I think the biggest question with this time travel theory is why? Why would Ryder need to go back to the Milky Way that badly? They have enough to deal with in Andromeda. If Ryder was going to travel back in time to any timeline, it would probably be during the war involving the Jardin and the detonation of the Scourge so that they could figure out what happened. And since their storyline revolves around that specific incident, what actual reason would they have to do anything in the Milky Way? All of their problems are in the Andromeda galaxy, including their family and the initiative. I just don't see a valid reason for this time jump back into the past. And I've seen theories where Ryder comes back to the past to help Liara revive or find Shepard. 
And I just think that is so far-fetched and doesn't make sense to me. Why would Liara need Ryder when she has a fully capable roster of friends and the Shatterbroker resources at her fingertips? Maybe you could say Ryder is special because of Sam, so Liara needs Sam. But again, why? I also don't see them bringing in Ryder this way to help in a plot that revolves around Shepard. Ryder already lived in the shadow of Shepard in Andromeda. Why would you remove them from their own established plot and setting only to focus on Shepard again? I guess anything is possible with good writing, but I just don't see it. And when it comes to a possible wormhole theory, there is speculation that Ryder could have found a way to travel back to the Milky Way galaxy instantly by using the remnant tech or something found in Andromeda. And it's important to remember that if Ryder travels back to the Milky Way galaxy from 2819, that would take them to the future of the original trilogy's timeline. They would be in the Milky Way galaxy and it would still be 2819, meaning the events of the trilogy would have already happened 634 years prior. So yeah, this could be a way to connect the two galaxies, if there was a wormhole travel possibility, maybe even using the Geth telescope. But there's no way this theory could work where both timelines are active. If Ryder comes back, majority of the original trilogy crew would be dead, considering it would be 2819, and we wouldn't get to see the direct aftermath of Mass Effect 3's ending. So that really wouldn't make sense. And if Liara goes to Andromeda shortly after the events of Mass Effect 3, Ryder would be in cryostasis, so that doesn't really make sense either. The only way this could work is if Liara went to Andromeda many years after the events of Mass Effect 3, roughly 600 years later. And there's plenty of speculation on whether or not Liara is older in the trailer, or if it's just a higher res model showing the wrinkles in her face. So we have no idea how old she is, but I think out of all the time travel slash wormhole possibilities, this one makes the most sense. Liara could have even maybe stayed awake during her journey to Andromeda, aging her and making her around 740, which would put her in her matriarch stage in life. And that could explain if she's aged, but who knows? Maybe after the ending of Mass Effect 3, Bioware decides the endings are too hard to explain. So they push Liara into Andromeda's timeline. I doubt it, but I'd hate to be the one writing the next game after how complicated the endings are. But I don't think Liara is leaving the Milky Way, regardless of what timeline. After the fall of Thessia, after everything with Shepard and the Reapers, and after establishing herself as the Shadow Broker, I really don't see a reason why she would want to leave her galaxy. She'd have a lot to rebuild, and no doubt after Mass Effect 3's ending, there will be a power vacuum. After the Council's failures, after the elusive man's death, after Cerberus is left without a leader, even after everything with Omega, Liara would heavily be involved in maintaining power and fixing the galaxy after everything. She had always been dedicated to helping the Milky Way galaxy. It was her home, in my opinion anyways. I've also seen some multiverse theories, some to the extent that some fans think our next antagonist will be an evil shepherd from another universe, and some that are actually pretty well thought out. But I still don't see them doing that. I think Clone Shepherd was wacky enough that that's why it was included in a very lighthearted DLC instead of the main game. It was intended to be a joke and not to be some serious plot. And I feel the same way about time travel and wormholes and multiverses. Yes, they can work. And with good writing, they could probably be good. But Mass Effect just feels more grounded to me. Yes, it's a series about aliens and space, but it's also about humanity and being relatable. So I think the next game will have something that can reflect that. So yes, I do think there's a bunch of ways to connect the galaxies, but the endings to Mass Effect 3 need to be addressed. And we, the player, need to see how our actions affected the galaxy. They have to address that first and foremost, in my opinion. So these are the ways I think the next game could connect the two galaxies and some theories I'm also not a huge fan of. What do you think? What connections make sense to you and what theories do you like and not like? Let me know in the comments and thank you for watching.